Um, thank you, Dr. Gungwala. I really appreciate that very kind introduction. It's an honor to be presenting today along with Dr. Goldberg, Dr. Johari, and with you. So um, without further ado, I will share my screen and begin uh, this presentation. So good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure and an honor to share the many years of research that my empathy program team members at Mass General Hospital have done that have resulted in the training um, that I'm going to be sharing the research uh, process a little bit and also uh, the ways that em empathy relates to physician wellness and patient care. Um, as Dr. Gendwala has said, I am the founder and chief scientific officer and CEO of Empathetics. It's an organization that now um, delivers the empathy training that you'll hear about in an online format for broad dissemination in healthcare systems. I like to begin with one of my favorite quotes, which is from Immanuel Kant, which is, compassion is one of the impulses that nature has implanted in us to do what duty alone may not accomplish. Many people in healthcare today, especially with the stresses of the pandemic, are, are doing their duties. And um, it, it's a very important reminder how important compassion and empathy are at a time when the world has seen unprecedented suffering and sickness. The impact of the coronavirus, I understand, is still very significant in India. It continues to plague our country as well. And we have moved from a healthcare system that once looked more like this, where doctors and patients could be close together, could be sharing eye contact and understanding one another's emotions to a time when the way we convey that we're here for our patients looks more like this with physical signs, the importance of eye contact, but how difficult it is to be treated by healthcare professionals who have most of their bodies covered up um, in an effort to protect themselves so they can continue to work with patients and not become ill themselves. So we're going to talk about empathy and its benefits to healthcare. We're going to touch on what is empathy and how is it different from compassion. We'll talk about how it affects the patient experience very profoundly, how burnout is um, a challenge and how empathic care actually contributes to condition, condition wellness and job satisfaction. And finally, some words about how empathy and compassion actually help hard health outcomes. It is not just about providing a better patient experience, but it also contributes to better health care. So, some years ago, I did a webinar at the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Care, which is the center that Dr. Goldberg is associated with and the one that Dr. Ganjwala referred to. Um, and we asked about 500 uh, physicians and hospital administrators at the present time, did you believe that empathic care was on the rise, declining, or about the same? And you'll see that about half believed that empathic care was declining. And sadly to say, the statistics have not gotten better since that survey. And when asked how many believe that their institutions or clinics could benefit from empathy training, 90% of the respondents said yes. And then when we asked on this poll, um, how, what, what were people contributing, uh, attributing these barriers to empathy? We found that um, only 4% believed that patients were more demanding 21% uh, said it had to do with burnout, 18% to greater computer use, but almost 60% believed it had to do with lack of time. 
And one of the myths that I'd like to dispel today in our discussion is that empathy takes Showing empathy and compassion actually saves time because we tune in to the greatest concerns that our patients have instead of wasting time avoiding what they want to speak about. The big question has always been, is empathy something can, that can be taught or is empathy just an inborn trait? This question was what led me to pursue um, an empathy neuroscience of empathy fellowship at Harvard Medical School, where I got to take a deep dive into the neuroscience of empathy, because my question was, could we do something about this trend? So before we go further, I'd like to just share some definitions because it's sometimes confusing. What is the difference between sympathy, empathy, and compassion? Sympathy is an ancient term that was uh, brought into the lexicon when people noticed that we share emotions with one another. We actually uh, feel suffering when we see someone suffering. And it has come to mean feeling sorry for people or even taking pity on them. Empathy is a much newer term, um, about 100 years old, and it is from the Greek meaning in someone's suffering. And it means that we are understanding the thoughts and really feeling with others, not just feeling for. And neuroscience shows that when we resonate and feel with others' pain, that motivates empathic concern and empathic behaviors. Just to contrast, antipathy has similar roots, which means against or avoiding another person's suffering. And it's difficult to be in between showing that we care or showing that we don't. So we have to be careful that we are not conveying antipathy when we are detached and not really tuned in to patients' uh, concerns. And finally, compassion is the Latin word that means co with someone suffering. And it really is the response that we see. When we say someone is compassionate, it's because we have noticed something that they are doing, a tone of voice, a look, a behavior. So empathy is the input to help us appreciate what other people are feeling and thinking. And compassion is the outpouring. It's the it's the good heartedness that comes out of us when we want to respond to others. So we will talk first about empathy and the patient experience, because after all, the patient experience is what they leave our care with, and it's what is to them. They may assume that they're going to get excellent medical care, but how they're treated is what, what they go home with. So there are four basic components to empathy. Empathy is not just all about feeling, it's about cognitively understanding what people are going through and being curious about their perspective and how they see the world. It, is, uh, it comes from that saying, walking in someone else's shoes and looking through their eyes. The affective or emotional component of empathy is that emotional resonance that we feel when we see someone sad and we have mirror neurons in our brains that actually pick up those feelings and trigger the same feelings within ourselves. Another component of empathy is that behavioral component that's motivated by perceiving others' pain and suffering, and that is behavioral empathy, which we also call compassion. And there is a moral component, an overlap, that when we see people who are suffering or sad, that we are moved to do something. And sometimes just perceiving it is not enough to get us to do something, but our moral inclinations often get us past the feeling of that not having enough time or energy and doing the right thing. I will refer you to my article in the Journal of the American Medical Association called Empathy in Medicine, a Neurobiological Perspective to share some of the details about how empathy and the brain works. 
So one of the biggest challenges to empathy is when physicians and nurses become emotionally aroused due to perceived threats or real threats that patients are, uh, are directing toward us. This can be a criticism, it can be uh, disappointment in an outcome, it can be um, a lack of understanding uh, what their expectations were about care, and then they may become very angry and, and even somewhat attacking. And when these behaviors uh, are directed at healthcare professionals, just like any other human being, we get emotionally aroused. And um, unless we're being physically threatened, um, it's really important from, from our professional role to remain curious about why the person is so upset rather than getting automatically triggered to become upset ourselves. The reason this happens, of course, is that when we perceive a threat, the amygdala signals the brainstem to have this autonomic nervous system reaction. And um, our heart rate, our our uh, perspiration, our blood pressure, our respiration rate, all these uh, reactions happen extremely quickly. And also the cranial nerves, which are have their nuclei in the brainstem for tone of voice and facial muscle expression are, um, are also triggered um, really in about 50 milliseconds. And so it's this emotional arousal that often interferes with empathy because when we feel emotionally aroused, we direct our attention at ourselves. And this screenshot will show you how when we measure physiologic responses between patients and physicians, we could see exactly how emotionally activated patients became when doctors said things like, I don't really have time for all of this, or I thought I went over this last time. And the patient's tracing here in pink gets very um, charged up and becomes angry, um, whereas better communication skills might have managed the patient's questions and um, concerns in a much more uh, compassionate way. And our research shows that patient and physician physiology actually matches up like a mirror when patients feel understood. So one of the first steps to becoming more empathic and compassionate is through self-awareness. And um, I, I can assure you that I've used this photograph of the Taj Mahal um, for years, well before this webinar, but I love it because the only reason we can see the details of this beautiful, uh, this beautiful monument is that the water is still and calm. And I use this picture to show that when we too can remain still and calm and open our perception to the details in our patients' faces and postures and voices that we become automatically more tuned in. We also really train on self-awareness and mindfulness and self-regulation skills in order to find quick ways to remain calm and to get centered so that we have a professional and a caring presence. Um, the studies I did in my fellowship led to creation of this empathy acronym, which is now um, a trademarked a way to remember how we really connect. And it's the subject of, of my book. Um, and we connect with others through eye contact, through noticing their muscles of facial expression, to interpreting what their posture and position means and what our posture and position conveys, such as standing over people with a dominant position, naming their affect, understanding their tone of voice, hearing the whole person and recognizing what our reaction is quite quickly, realizing that many times we are reacting because the person is suffering. And when they're suffering, they might be critical of us, they might be yelling at us, they might be um, threatening all kinds of things. But as long as our physical safety is ensured, our reaction is really a mirror of 
what they are going through. And our response would be to try to calm this person down and not to fight back so that we can get to a level understanding of what they are so worried about or so upset about. So you may ask, how do we know that empathy training works? Well, after I um, developed some training interventions based on the neuroscience of empathy, I put together a brief training intervention and then I looked for volunteer departments at Mass General Hospital to engage their physicians in training in the empathy training. And six departments participated. They were medicine, surgery, orthopedic surgery, psychiatry, uh, ophthalmology, and anesthesia. And we wanted to see if a brief training intervention on emotional communication, perspective taking, and self-management skills would actually result in higher patient ratings of physician empathy. And please note that we were not asking for self-report because we do not believe that physician self-ratings are um, very accurate, but we concerned with whether patients could see a difference in our randomized control trial. So some quick results. We found that our training group, um, and just to be clear, we had a cohort of 100 physicians. A computer randomized them to the training or control group. Uh, patients rated the physicians before any training took place um, and were not aware of a training that was coming up. And then we had um, about 10 patients per doctor rate them after the training took place so that this was truly a randomized control trial. Their improvement in knowledge of the neurobiology um, was obviously much higher in the training group. Uh, we were very surprised and happy to see that our training resulted in much better facial expression decoding of patient emotions. Um, and you can see that our major outcome measure, uh, the care measure, showed that almost twice as many physicians received significantly higher empathy rating scores in the training group compared to the control group. And these are the items of our main outcome measure. You can read them yourself, um, but they comport to some of the most important ratings of physicians um, in, in, uh, in our country on rating um, hospitals, which is, are they really listened to? Are things explained clearly? And are they shown care and compassion? Our program evaluation received evaluations of 94% and above about whether this training was interesting, helpful, and whether they could apply the concepts directly to their clinical practice. And we did a one-year follow-up study with our original cohort at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary because they were still all together a year later. And you can see that their care measure scores were virtually identical up uh, one year after the training. Um, and then we asked the participants to self-evaluate in our randomized control trial about whether they learned not to interrupt, whether they were better at reading emotional cues, whether they could manage their own physiologic reactions and become more skilled at um, managing the patient's physiologic reactions and so that they had a greater um, ability to, to manage the relationships in a positive way. Um, the New York Times picked up on this study because it was one of the first to show that, um, actually it was the first to show that doctors could learn empathy. And this, um, this uh, misconception that empathy was something that could not be taught was really debunked. Um, in our study, and it was considered a groundbreaking uh, research to really shift the thinking about empathy being something that can be uh, taught and learned and that it could 
help physicians improve their understanding of patients and help patients feel more cared for and feel that they had been treated with compassion. Um, just to share quickly, um, this was, this training was uh, recently used in the field, not in a, uh, you know, a scientifically designed uh, randomized control trial, but at Sutter Health in California, they embarked on a journey with Empathetics, the program to see if it could improve um, the provider communication at their hospital. And they had a pilot cohort of nine departments, a completion rate of 86%. They used pre post observations and they had Sutter um, coaches trained by empathetics and used the empathetics training, um, the online training. They also had the trained coaches offer supplemental coaching to their clinicians. And they were very happy with their results that the, um, that the uh, clinician group scores that are used uh, nationally in, in the United States for the empathy cohort um, improved significantly. Um, they had the uh, OB department called out separately because they also got the, um, the in-person live training. Um, and this was the untrained group here at the end. And you will see here that the group in the middle here in orange is the OB group that received both the online training plus the uh, empathetics workshop and some coaching and they achieved a 90.4 percent patient satisfaction rating now we are in a period of time when almost no one can talk about healthcare without talking about the burnout epidemic and um, burnout has been a problem in medicine well before the pandemic. And this quote um, by Dr. Shapiro says, we believe one unintended and unfortunate side effect of medical training is that it produces physicians who believe that self-denial is valuable and necessary and that living under stress is normal. Well, these beliefs got put to the ultimate test and are continuing to be put to the ultimate test because of the extraordinary burdens and time and uh, dedication that's being required from healthcare physicians. Um, and obviously it is not a sustainable profession if we believe that self-denial and living under stress is, a, is, um, is normal. So what we are trying to suggest and recommend is that even during um, the challenges of a pandemic, that an emphasis on relationships and resources, on keeping open dialogue and having uh, opportunities for people to, to vent and discuss and to share what they're going through and to try to make meaning out of what is happening. Um, these things can start uh, with really contacting healthcare workers, checking in with them, because without constant dialogue and emphasis on the relationships, we can end up with despair, with isolation, depression, and even suicidal thoughts and actions. Uh, recent studies show that up to 42 to 58% of physicians are showing signs of burnout. And um, these numbers are just rising and they're also very significant in nurses. When stress rises, empathy suffers. And it's often because people feel too exhausted and too, um, too focused on their own suffering. Um, and empathy starts to wane for the patients and also for oneself. 
So this article is very interesting because it shows how empathy is a protective factor of burnout in physicians. And it shows how new neurophenomenological hypotheses regarding empathy and sympathy in the care relationship can actually bolster a sense of well-being. And I refer you to this, this excellent article. Um, burnout creates institutional risks because there are increased communication failures and tendency to take shortcuts. There are more errors and increased tendency to cover up rather than to disclose an increased dissonance between patients and providers. And um, at least in the United States, um, we see an increase in malpractice claims. So how does empathy actually improve clinician meaning in work and, and become a, perfect, a protective factor? Uh, we know that one of the reasons that people are drawn to healthcare professions is that the act of helping others is intrinsically rewarding. And um, it is actually the reason that the human species is in existence. It's because of the tendency toward collaboration, cooperation, and helpfulness, which was central to our existence um, from tribal times to the current day. And when we open our channels to look for meaning in work, to look for those moments when we make a difference, and they can be micro moments. And we also develop ways to give back to ourselves in the smallest ways. We realize that empathy is very empowering. And um, even in the midst of a horrible pandemic, there are things that we can be grateful for. You know, we can look for things that, um, you know, improve. For example, when there wasn't enough protective equipment to go around where hospital workers were terrified of contracting the virus. Um, once that threat was managed by getting the proper protective equipment, it took the stress and burden of being that worried about getting sick um, off the table. And so it, a reminder of things that, that are getting better as they are getting better and not only focusing on what is difficult and worse. And in this, in these pictures, you know, um, we can see that even with a gloved hand and a masked face, we can still offer the human touch. We can still be um, present in ways, um, even if in a masked face, so much of empathy is conveyed through the eyes. So, I would like to also mention the importance of something that sounds a little strange, which is self-empathy. Self-empathy is not the same as selfishness. Self-empathy is the recognition that you cannot pour water from an empty pitcher. Once the water is out of the pitcher, it has to be refilled if we're going to fill someone else's glass. And so we have to look at ways that will support our own well being so that we have the energy and stamina to face and help with compassion the people who are coming to us frightened, worried, sick, and um, at sometimes the point of death. So we need to address and Think of ways that we can keep our mental well being uh, front and foremost, that we attend to our physical needs through physical exercise, um, whether it be, um, you know, yoga poses or doing something for cardiac um, health, but neglecting our mental and physical uh, needs will lead to burnout. And understanding the importance of community cohesion, having leaders reach out to their workers, even if it's a 
quick phone call or an email to say, I'm thinking of you, how are you doing? So that people know they still belong to a community and that they know that their presence matters uh, to their leaders and to their organization. And finally, finding meaning in adversity is one of the keys to resilience. If we only look at all the things going wrong and the things that fill us with despair, we miss uh, many lessons that we learn about how we come together to face a crisis that the world can all relate to. I have just two slides about the importance of empathy and healthcare outcomes. My research group at Massachusetts General Hospital was frequently asked if improving the patient experience also had an impact on hard health outcomes. We uh, got a grant from the Gold Foundation and did a three-year study looking at every randomized control trial that claimed that patient-clinician relationship factors um, actually had the greatest result on a healthcare outcome. We did a systematic review and a meta-analysis of all randomized control trials. And I refer you to this 2014 PLOS One article for all the details, but I will show you that um, we found 13 very rigorously done studies that showed that just by showing empathy, using motivational interviewing and patient-centered care, um, that you know one of the greatest health challenges in the world is obesity, and that the p-value was zero, which means that the way the patient was treated in a in a weight loss program by his or her providers was a direct causation of their ability to lose weight. We had also beautiful p-values on studies of osteoarthritis where communication, empathy, and group discussions um, and pain evaluation were done um, to augment the uh, medical treatment. Um, lung infections also improved communication, empathy, and to share decision-making and asthma. Um, since we are facing so many lung infections today, we can really appreciate these well-done studies to show how much communication um, made a difference. Um, we've already talked about my book, which I refer to you because it discusses the power of empathy, not just in medicine, but also in leadership, in business, in parenting, and in everyday life. Um, there's a chapter on each of these topics. and. Um, and as, as we already you know, heard from Dr. Gen, Genjwala, that my TED Talk will also give you a deeper dive into some of these topics. It's, a, it's about a 17 minute TED Talk. So how do we put this all together to heal the emotion gap in medicine? First, we need a leadership commitment um, to, a, understanding how important these interpersonal factors are in healthcare. We need structural changes to make the delivery of healthcare as smooth and as problem-free as possible. Implementing training, whether it be empathy training, communication skills training, um, is very necessary so that everyone is on the same. Um, so I was saying that implementing training to um, to bring all members of the healthcare team up to the same level of skills and expectations um, also brings people together in a learning community, which also helps to um, mitigate against burnout. And building community is essential, bringing people together. Um, this is a pre-COVID <laughs> photograph, but um, we can come together wearing masks and still build community. And finally, tapping into our hearts and what brought us to healthcare professions and wanted us, made us want to help people. Um, when we lose that, that's when we really get burned out. And so tapping back into the joy 
of medicine and joy of helping and being part of the solution and not part of the problem is probably one of the most rewarding opportunities we have as healthcare professionals today. And my last slide is a beautiful quote um, that says, your vocation lies in the place where your deep gladness meets the world's deep need. And our world has rarely been in such deep need um, as we've all faced this past year. And we hope that this presentation will help invigorate and enliven people to do the work, the extraordinary work that lies before them. So thank you so much for your attention.